So, after two by-election defeats, are the wheels coming off the Johnson bus? The Housing Secretary, Robert Jenrick, will be with us in a moment. Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves on why Labour thinks they're back on the road to number 10. Northern Ireland's Democratic Unionist Party had some trouble deciding who should be at the wheel in recent times, but in his first television interview since becoming leader, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson tells our senior Ireland correspondent, David Blevins, how he sees the way ahead. Plus, I'll ask Adam Finn, who's a member of the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, if we're still cruising towards the easing of lockdown on July the 19th. And a broadcast exclusive, the veteran American pollster Frank Luntz on a new survey of the electorate's mood. There may be trouble ahead. But first, the Housing Secretary, Robert Jenrick, joined me. Mr Jenrick, the new Health Secretary says in an article this morning that we have to learn to accept the existence of COVID just as we do with the flu. Now, according to the Office for National Statistics, uh, there are some 20,000 deaths associated with flu in a typical year. Are we now saying that that annual toll with COVID is inevitable? Hi, well, good morning, Trevor. I think we are now reaching a different phase in the virus. We're not going to put the COVID-19 virus behind us forever. We're going to have to learn to live with it. But thanks to the enormous success of our vaccine programme, the fact that now we've got to the point where 83 per cent of adults in this country have had at least one jab, we should be able to think about how we can return to normality as much as possible. And the data that we're seeing that the Prime Minister is reviewing at the moment ahead of his decision point on the roadmap looks very positive. It does seem as if we can now move forward and move to a much more permissive regime where we move away from many of those restrictions that have been so difficult for us. And as you say, learn to live with the virus. That does mean that we're going to have to treat it carefully. We're going to have to keep on monitoring the cases and we're going to have to ensure that every adult gets double vaxxed because that is the key to keeping the virus under control as we move into the autumn and the winter. That's admirably clear and it looks as though you are following the Prime Minister's suggestion that um, we will be put, lifting the uh, restrictions. But the BMA, the British Medical Association, is urging caution. For example, keeping the requirement for face masks in public places. Now, um, Mr Jenrick, will you be dumping your mask on July the 20th? Well, like many people, I want to uh, get away from these restrictions as quickly as I possibly can. And we don't want them to stay in place for a day longer than is necessary. We are going to, I think, now move into a period where there won't be legal restrictions. The state won't be telling you what to do, but you will want to exercise a degree of personal responsibility and judgment. So different people will come to different conclusions on things like masks, for example, and the Prime Minister will set out more detail on the, the national policy on some of those restrictions in the coming days. But there will be things that we all definitely need to do. As I say, it will be essential that every adult gets fully vaccinated. And there are still people in the uh, most significant categories, categories one to nine, who haven't been vaccinated. 50,000 people in those categories got vaccinated uh, in the last week. They've come forward relatively late in the process, but it's really important that we get uh, those remaining people vaccinated. It will also be important that we do things like making sure that uh, the most vulnerable get their flu vaccinations this autumn and winter, Mr. because Jenner, that will be a big issue. There will be things we need to do as a society we go to make to sure that, that we, keep through, we get through this. But before we, could, before go, we go on to that, can we just deal with the question I asked you? If you are permitted, will you be getting rid of your mask? I, I will. I, I don't particularly want to wear a mask. I don't think a, a lot of people uh, enjoy doing it. What, it. We will be moving into a phase, though, where these will be matters of personal choice. And so some members of society will want to do so uh, for perfectly legitimate reasons. But it will be a different period where we as private citizens make these judgments rather than the government telling you what to do. 
Okay. Now, apparently, today is National Thank You Day. Um, whose idea was that? And um, what would you, the government, like the nation to be doing once they've stopped watching this programme? Well, it was actually a, a bottom-up idea. It came from local communities. Uh, they came together and established this idea that this is a moment in which we can all go and say a big thank you to those who've helped us uh, in our daily lives over the course of the last year. Perhaps those people who've gone out of their way to support the community through COVID-19 or others who've done good work. Uh, the Prime Minister will be hosting uh, some of those who've helped us through the pandemic at, at number 10. And I know people in my own community that I would like to say a big thank you to. Isn't this a bit previous? You, you've just advised me to wait for the Prime Minister's statement on July the 19th, but you're encouraging everybody to barbecue today. I mean, couldn't this have waited a couple of weeks until we actually know what the guidance is going to be? Isn't this yet another case of the government sending mixed messages? No, the government didn't create uh, National Thank You Day. It's actually been created by members of the to public. Back it. You didn't have to back it today. We can say thank you any time in the next six months if we want to. Well, as I say, the government didn't create this day. It's been created by members of the public who themselves wanted to say thank you. Of course, uh, there are guidelines in place that you have to follow if you're holding an event today. And I'm sure the prime minister and others who, who are doing so will make sure that they are followed. But the point of the day uh, is for those of us who benefited from the hard work and uh, compassion, empathy that others have provided over the course of the last year to reach out to them and say thank you. And that can be done in many ways. Uh, there may be some people who are holding socially distanced get togethers, but there'll be plenty of other people who might use this opportunity simply to pick up the phone to somebody uh, who's done good work and really helped them out over the course of the last year. Yes, indeed. We can say thank you in many ways. Wouldn't one way be for the health secretary or the prime minister to pick up the phone to the, let's say, the Royal College of Nursing or the BMA and say, you know what, we've decided that 1% pay rise, which is below inflation, is going to be boosted by 2 or 3%. That would be a real way to say thank you, wouldn't it? Well, we all want to reward those people who've worked in the NHS and social care as local government secretary. I feel very strongly about that. That at the moment is a topic for the independent pay review body who will be providing advice to the health secretary and the government in the coming months. And armed with that, we'll make a decision. But certainly in my role, I've always striven to provide local government with the resource it needs to fund social care. We've done that over the course of the pandemic. We've now done it with two record-breaking settlements for the local government sector since Boris Johnson became Prime Minister. And I very much hope we'll be in a position to do that in the future. So uh, we're not uh, stuck to the 1%. It could be higher in the end. Well, the process is that uh, the recommendation is judged by the independent pay review body and then it comes to ministers for a final decision. So nothing is, is set in stone, but we as ministers will have to wait for the advice that we receive from the pay review body. And that's the right thing to do. Right. Well, let's keep talking about how we say thank you. You say in your release that you want to thank people who have provided refuge for women facing domestic abuse, which everybody agrees has risen during lockdown. So... Now, women who are afraid to venture out onto the high street in case they run into their abusers are being urged to rock up today to a cheery barbecue whilst having nowhere to go later because of lack of funds for refugees. Now, that would be a good way of saying thank you, and it's, I think that's in your bailiwick, isn't it? Why not say thank you today with some more money for uh, domestic abuse refugees for the women who have suffered violence? Well, Trevor, we are doing that. Uh, we passed the Domestic Abuse Act earlier in the year, which is a landmark piece of legislation to ensure that women and men uh, who are victims of domestic abuse get the support that they need in safe and secure accommodation, such as refuges. We fully funded that major commitment with £125 million. And that money is now with local councils who are ensuring that local services get the support that they need. And in fact, I spoke uh, last week at the Women's Aid Conference to the brilliant people who run those refuges across the country to say thank you to them and also wrote to every local council in the country urging them to use that money wisely 
and amongst other services that they commission to make sure that they properly fund women's refuges because they do a fantastic job. They have often been funded in quite a hand-to-mouth way in recent decades. That needs to come to an end now that we've got this very significant amount of extra funding available for them. Did um, the leaders of Women's Aid read out to you what they said in their report a couple of months ago, which is uh, the 90 million announced in the budget today is not enough. They then go on to say that uh, they need uh, 393 million pounds uh, for of funding and that there is a shortfall of 200 million pounds in the government's current plans. What are you going to do about that? Well, I, I don't recognise those numbers. They're not ones I've actually seen. The, the amount of, funding, report, that, the amount of funding that I'm we... Read, I'm reading it out to you. Uh, well, I understand that, but the amount of money that we provided, £125 million, is actually considered to be fully funding the refuge and domestic uh, abuse uh, duties that now fall by on local you, councils as a result. but not by women's aid. Well, I had, a, I had very good conversation with uh, the chief executive of Women's Aid and with representatives uh, of those who run refuges uh, during the week. They appreciate the funding. Of course, people would always like to have more money, but this is a very significant increase in the amount of funding that any government has given in the past for women's refuges and for other services that will be provided uh, for victims of domestic abuse. The key thing now is to make sure that councils perform their duties under this new piece of legislation correctly, and they include giving women and other victims of domestic abuse priority for social housing if they need to leave their home, ensuring that they get the support services that they need that can be delivered in many different settings, and, as I say, making sure that refuges across the country are put on a sustainable financial footing. So we don't see the situation that I'm afraid we have done in the past, which is where some of those refugees are having to kind of survive year okay. in, year out with too little money and not uh, long-term sustainable funding. We're going okay. to change that. Well, perhaps you need to have another conversation with them. But let's, let's talk about um, Batley and Spen. Um, you lost when you might have won. Do you blame Matt Hancock? Well, look, of course, I'm disappointed that we lost. We had a great candidate, Ryan Stevenson. I'd love to have seen him in Parliament. But governments very, very rarely take seats off oppositions in by-elections. In fact, there's only been one instance in recent years, which was Hartlepool, which was an exceptional result. Actually, this was the biggest swing from an opposition to the party of government for 30 nine years, so in my lifetime. So it was still a fantastic result for the Conservative Party, albeit not exactly what we would have hoped for. Um, and I think there are a lot of questions for Keir Starmer as to how the Labour Party are just scraping home by 300 or so votes when they should be romping home in these sorts of elections. OK, well, um, uh, here's a question for you. Um, given that you had a 8,000 vote leg up from George Galloway, who took votes from Labour. Um, actually, it wasn't that good a result for you. Um, and surely there's something more fundamental going on here, as there was in Chesham and Amersham. Could it be that, um, like in Chesham, many people in those very pretty villages uh, around Batley think that your planning reforms mean that your idea of levelling up is allowing developers to concrete over their villages and fields? No, I don't agree with that at all. I mean, on, on the question of the by-elections, as I say, governments extremely rarely take seats off the opposition in by-elections. Of course, it was also a disappointing result in Chesham and Amersham. But the argument put out there very disingenuously by the Lib Dems that there were huge amounts of houses being built in that area uh, was simply untrue. Last year, only 100 houses were built in the Chesham and Amersham constituency, which I think was the 10th lowest of any local authority in the whole country. What we want to see are good quality, environmentally sustainable homes with the infrastructure around them being built across the country uh, so that young people and families can get onto the housing ladder. That's absolutely critical to levelling up to tackling intergenerational unfairnesses in this country. And we're going to 
redouble our efforts to build those homes, but do so in a way that protects green spaces. They won't be being built on the green belt. And we want to make a planning system which is much more engaging than the current one, in which only one or two percent of the public have any contact with in their lifetimes. When we're talking about um, levelling up, uh, on Friday you were in a place called Kidsgrove, which is near Stoke-on-Trent. Um, you were talking about the importance of the investments that you're making uh, locally, and you tweeted, levelling up in action where 20, £17 million of investment from the Towns Fund has enabled the reopening of the sports centre there in Kidsgrove. Um, would it not have been simpler if the Conservative-led Staffordshire County Council hadn't withdrawn their subsidy, subsidy in 2017 to that sports centre in the first place, then you wouldn't have had to make that investment. Well, the Towns Fund is part of our now almost £10 billion investment into towns and smaller cities across the country aimed to improve living standards, improve quality of life. And I was really pleased to go to, to Kidsgrove by Stoke-on-Trent, as you say, on Friday and see how it's impacting people's lives there. The decision actually was taken by a Labour council there. Uh, it was very unfortunate. As a result of the Towns Fund, we're changing that, and that sports centre is being brought back into community use as we speak. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to do more things like that across the country, particularly examples like that where it's actually community ownership. That's a sports centre that's going to be run by the local community itself, not by a council, but by a group of uh, engaged local residents coming together. And we're putting funding available for those sorts of schemes to happen right across the country. One last very quick question, if I may, uh, Mr. Jenrick. Um, last week was the fourth anniversary of the awful events at the Grenfell Tower, and the government has been making quite a lot of money available to repair cladding. But the estimates uh, to deal with the range of buildings across the country um, are as high as £15 billion, and you've made about £3.5 billion available. That means that many uh, flat owners across the country are having to pay, and we've seen lots of um, reports this week, are having to pay the price of their entire properties in order to repair the cladding. That surely cannot be right. Well, I have huge sympathy with those uh, leaseholders who are placed in an impossible situation. The government is actually putting over £5 billion uh, towards this issue. We're ensuring that the most dangerous material, ACM cladding and other unsafe forms of cladding, are removed from all high-rise buildings in the country at no cost to leaseholders. That work is underway now. We're making good progress. Rest? We're also... Uh, trying to ensure there's a much more sensible and proportionate approach to risk on other buildings, particularly but the lower rise ones, because we are seeing examples of leaseholders being asked to pay bills for works which seem to be unnecessary. There's no actually higher risk of an individual living in a, uh, a purpose-built flat or a high-rise building than in any other building. In fact, more people okay. die in fires in houses and bungalows than they do in high-rise apartments. So okay. we're working with lenders and insurers and surveyors to try to create a much right. more sensible and proportionate way forwards. Mr Jenrick, thank you very much indeed.